Good morning, Mountain View. Family, friends, guests, welcome all of you. It's, it's so good to see you here. I hope, like me, this is so good. I feel like I say that every Sunday, but it's so good. Uh, I just love being together with all of you and worshiping our Lord together, hearing you sing. We continue to have audio issues because you're so loud, but please don't stop. Don't mind us over here, okay? Uh, keep belting out the praises to the one to whom it's due. Such a joy to, to begin this series um, we're calling Adorn the Doctrine, this, uh, this, this six-week verse-by-verse exposition through this letter to Titus uh, from Paul. I have been loving reading this short, just three-chapter letter, um, but I am a little bit, I'm a little bit upset. I don't know who captured this photo of me this week. Um, if you can't read that, it says, actual photo of your pastor trying to cram all the wonderful biblical insight from his studies into a 30-minute sermon. Okay, that's, that's what we try to do. Uh, thank you, Brother Herbert, for calling me out there asking, when have I ever preached a 30-minute sermon? Fair, touche, touche, but we're going to try. I only said we were going to try. After all, this morning, we're only going to attempt to get through the first uh, four verses. As I said before, this is one of the shortest of Paul's letters. Uh, it's just 659 words in 45 verses. Let me ask, who is familiar with the book? Of, who's read the book of Titus recently? Okay. Okay, some of you, this, I feel like this is a criminally understudied book of the Bible. Some of you are probably like, What's Titus? What is he talking about? No, um, I won't insult you that way. This is not a trick, though. It is a real book of the Bible. It's a brief one. But uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you want, you can grab one off the shelf back there. And if you, seriously, if you don't own a Bible, please keep one of those red Bibles and study through this throughout the week with us. Um, this, this, this book, this letter, the letter to Titus from Paul, is uh, second only in its brevity to to Philemon. But it, along with two other, the two letters to Timothy, another one of Paul's young converts like Titus and ministry partners, this collection, one, two Timothy and Titus, are commonly known as the pastoral epistles due to their charges and practical church instruction. As I said, addressed to Titus, who was probably one of Paul and Barnabas' most early Greek converts, and trusted gospel companions. He's, he's mentioned 13 times in the New Testament, yet not once in the book of Acts. It is most likely, though, he traveled with Paul on several of his missionary journeys. We actually learn the most about him in the epistle to the church in Galatia, where Paul writes about Titus being such a prized and beloved disciple that he actually accompanied Paul to the council of Jerusalem, recorded in Acts 15. Again, Titus' name isn't mentioned there. But he was such a prized convert and evidence of Paul's gospel being preached to the Gentiles that this young man, we don't know how old he is, even at the, this time of this letter being written, he still is a young man. So he was even younger then, probably from Paul and Barnabas's, Barnabas' ministry in Antioch. But I was just imagining that this week and thinking about that. Imagine being an early convert in Paul's ministry, a Gentile, and all of this is very new, right? The Spirit falling on Gentile people, the Greeks receiving the Holy Spirit, and Paul being called to give an account in Jerusalem to the elders there, to Peter, James, and John, the disciples, about what's going on with the Holy Spirit falling. We're hearing all these reports, what's happening. They have false teachers coming in and, and making different claims on what must happen if this is true. And Paul brings this young man and he comes and he stands before the disciples, these men who walked with Jesus to give an account of his gospel. Wow. So this is very exciting. He was a trusted, he was a, a trusted partner of Paul's instrumental in delivering the letters back and forth and shepherding the very difficult and delicate situations in the church of Corinth. And he's mentioned a number of times in those letters as well. But focusing on this one, Paul's instructions to Titus, this is probably being written towards the end of Paul's life. Uh, perhaps Paul is on his last of his missionary journeys 
He has left Titus on the island of Crete where they had done work together. And his purpose is, is given in verse 5 of chapter 1. But he's telling, um, he's telling Titus, these are the instructions to order the churches. Appoint elders. Um, encourage them in, in a certain conduct of how we ought to live. If we believe the truth of the gospel, that manifests itself in gospel living. And then Paul instructs us in this letter what that looks like. So the, that's the purpose. The style of this letter is very straightforward, probably why it is so brief. We must live in a way that reflects the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we claim now to believe. The major themes of this letter, therefore, are salvation, sound doctrine, and good works, and the relationship between them, those three. In other words, how does the gospel produce godliness and good works? The gospel must produce godliness and good works if we truly have faith in the Holy Spirit's transformation according to the gospel. The emphasis is neatly pictured in this series, Adorn the Doctrine, coming from a phrase Paul uses in chapter 2 where he instructs them then, these various groups in the church, to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. How neat of a picture is that? To adorn means to make something beautiful or make something attractive. Right? It involves an action of putting something on. Now, you believe this gospel, you believe this teaching, you believe this doctrine, now put it on, reflect it in such a way in your life that people are attracted to the gospel of Jesus Christ by the way it's transforming and working itself out in the good works by which you live, out in the testimony and before the world. Paul is pleading to conduct oneself in such a way that accurately reflects the gospel of Jesus Christ and glorifies our Father in heaven in such a way that the world sees it as it truly is. It is beautiful. It is attractive. May the world be attracted to Christ by how we treat and how we love each other both inside the church and in the world. And over the next six weeks, I hope we would both consider that individually and personally, but also corporately as a church together. If we claim to have life in Christ, that's the first part of our mission at Mountain View is to have life. What does that look like as we do life inside of the church and then share that life we have come to know in the gospel outside the church? That's our mission. Have life, do life, share life. And I hope we can take an honest reflection, being convicted and guided along by the Holy Spirit to honestly look and say, is that true of us, Mountain View? Is that true of me, Nate? Let us pray as we get into it. Father, thank you so much for our time this morning to worship you. Lord, we pray that you are glorified in all we do together from our confession of the truth as your word declares it to our, our singing and praising you according to the truth as revealed in your word and in the proclamation, Lord, of which I hope it, it is accurate and paints a clear picture of who you are, that you would be seen, Lord, as you truly are, as beautiful and as attractive, as gracious and as loving, as holy and as righteous as you really are. Lord, make me small and make yourself great this morning among us. We love you, help us to love you, and help us to love others. Amen. Amen. So, we're attempting to tackle the first verse of Paul's letter. Just one sentence, which is four verses in the Greek, but one sentence is our aim this morning. So, uh, it also happens to be, though, Paul's second longest introduction out of all of his letters. But by his spirit, we will make it through it. I'm calling, I'm titling this sermon, A Christian's Commitment. And I want to focus on five commitments of a genuine believer in Christ, as we see from Paul's introduction here. Let's read it together. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect 
and their knowledge of the faith which accords with godliness. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Paul. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Our first commitment I want to look at is a Christian is committed first and primarily to their identity in Christ above all. Remember, Paul had many accomplishments and achievements by which he could have identified himself as he writes and instructs the churches. Those are recorded in Philippians 3. You can see them, right? He declares to them, I could have come to you with all of my accomplishments, circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, and we know Paul was most advanced in his knowledge of law at that time, studying under Rabbi Gamaliel. This guy was the man in regards to his understanding of the law and his obedience to it by which he says, in accordance to the law, blameless. Again, then he would go on to say, though now I count that all as rubbish in my pursuit of knowing Christ. None of that matters now because I am found in Christ. The best of my, of my righteousness Filthy rags compared to Christ's perfect righteousness. Paul understood there is nothing greater than our identity in Christ. And he happily bears the title, a servant of God. Not with the connotations we often think of it as with the drudgery and the toil of serving under a hard taskmaster. This is that term doulos, which we looked several weeks back when we went through Romans 5 and 6 again. The Greek term doulos, which can be translated in English as slave, bondservant, or servant. And the English translations vary upon the context by which, but each of those have more or less rights than the other. A bondservant is probably the best translation, and that was someone who had sold themselves into slavery or had been purchased to another. See, Paul understands, as I hope you also do, that he has been bought at a price. We, in Christ, have been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. We are not our own, but we belong to God. We are now, or ought to be, willful and complete servants to our owner and master, the Lord God. Unlike its modern connotations, slave or servant, Paul was proud to wear this following the same line of Moses, David, Elijah, and many great servants of the Lord who proudly declared themselves, I am a servant of the Most High exactly what Paul does here, affirming his calling from the one true covenant-keeping almighty God of the universe. That is nothing to be ashamed of. Paul was not ashamed to declare himself a slave of God. In all of his letters, no, rather than pulling over those earthly achievements and identifying himself by these things, he calls himself a prisoner For the sake of Christ Jesus, when he's writing from prison, he calls himself an apostle, as he does here afterwards, uh, a servant, a bondservant, a slave in the book of Romans. All these different terms he is proud to hold because God is the only worthy master. It is a joy to serve him, for he is good, he is righteous, he is fair, he is gracious, and he is merciful. If you missed that sermon several weeks back or that series of sermons in Roman 5 and 6, we talked a lot about what it means to be a slave. And Paul there says, 
everyone is a slave. You are a slave to whom you obey, either sin or a slave to God. And as we've been reminded, though, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. But you are a slave to the one whom you obey. So is it true? Can we identify with our primary identity, the same as Paul's, a servant of God? Can you do that this morning? Are we not first what God has said that we are? Do we share Paul's commitment to his identity in Christ? If you do not, if you cannot say, I have received the grace of God, and I have been purchased by that blood. I have been saved. Please, can we sort that out this morning? If that's you, there's nothing more important than understanding one's identity before God. For at the end of all this, sure, the world celebrates all those other achievements and accomplishments, but when you stand before God, they will mean nothing. Paul understood that, and I hope we do as well. May we be found in Christ when we stand before that holy, righteous judge. May we be covered by the perfect righteousness of Christ. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. For the sake of the faith of God's elect. Paul's commitment as a servant of God was for the church of Christ. Do we share the same commitment with Paul to the church? Paul reminds us in Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 that we are members in Christ. We are members of one body. And a body cannot operate and function to its capacity without every member doing its part. Some of those members are more visible some of them are more hidden, but every part is just as necessary as the other. See, after by God's grace, when we are granted saving faith in Christ and we can identify ourselves in Him, we find our lives in the body of Christ. We have life in the body of Christ. Genuine life in Christ is followed by our joyful, obedient service to our Master, God our Savior, and to His body, of, the body of Christ, the church, His bride. This is how we do life. We serve. We commit ourselves to good works, caring for each other and for the demonstration of His goodness and love to the world, to the glory of the Father. For the sake of the faith of God's elect, or God's chosen. This is good news for us. It means that God will save by faith all those that he has graciously chosen in love. It means if you have known the grace and love of Christ, you can't be lost. Nobody falls out of his hands. All of the elect, all of the chosen will respond in faith as Jesus reminds us in John chapter 10 that my sheep will hear my voice, and follow after me. If that is you, if you are in the pursuit of Jesus Christ to know Him and to make Him known, be encouraged. You're not going to fall out of the Savior's hands. He will save you. Your faith will be prompted and empowered by the Holy Spirit who is the Almighty God. You're not escaping that power when God has set his mind on you before the foundations of the world. In Ephesians 1, he doesn't fail. Commitment number two, Christian, is then are you committed to the church? Are you committed to doing life together, nourishing Christ's body, the church, serving Christ's bride, the church. How are you exercising the gifts you have been given? You, each 
in Christ have a significant role in the body of Christ. For us to operate as the church and fulfill what God has called us to do in here by the Holy Spirit, we need each other to be each playing our role to complete the mission of making disciples of which we know, again, God will not fail. It will happen. There will be disciples in heaven from every nation. What are you doing to equip, to edify, to build up the church of Christ? Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect in their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Third, Paul was committed to the church's knowledge of the truth. And he qualifies truth with that which accords to godliness. We must make a note here. See that knowledge and truth are not the same thing. Truth, Paul says, is that which accords with godliness. Truth is consistent with God as there is no truth found outside of him. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 65 calls God the God of truth. Paul in Ephesians 4 calls Jesus, he says, the truth is in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, every time calls the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. In my life group, we meet on Wednesday evenings. We've been working through the attributes of God, a series of teachings from the ministry of formerly Dr. R.C. Sproul, Ligonier. This week, we worked through the reality of the truthfulness of God. And truth, simply put right, is reality. It's the way things actually are. It's not the way things appear to be. It's not the way you want things to be. It's the way they actually are. And it doesn't depend on your feelings about it. There he reminds us about nine characteristics of truth, and I'll just go through them quickly. He says, truth is divine. It's not original to this world or to man. Truth is from God. Two, truth is absolute. Truth makes exclusive claims. It's not dependent on other things. Even here, see, Paul says the knowledge of the truth, not a truth, the truth. There is only one truth, and it is found in God. The truth is objective. It is clearly defined. It is precise and specific. Jesus says every jot and tittle is true. It will all be accomplished. Truth is singular. There's only one body of truth. There aren't competing truths fragments or phases of it's all one truth is immutable or unchangeable it cannot be annulled it cannot be canceled it cannot be obligated and replaced it's unchangeable and it's universal it is true everywhere in the world in every culture all the time for every generation without exception truth is illuminating truth helps us know the world This is the difference between knowledge and truth. It's truth that helps us properly understand who God is, who therefore we are, why we exist here in this world. It illuminates all other things. It is trustworthy, reliable, dependent, sure, and steadfast. And truth is authoritative. It has the power to make demands upon your life, and I'm sorry, but it doesn't care how you feel. Truth is truth. And I promise you, the more that you submit yourselves to the truth of God, the more joy you find in submitting to Him, understanding that all God does and instructs for us is for His glory, which is for our good. The more we study and we discern what He has done and we see horrible things happening in Scripture by which God also turns out for good, even as Joseph declared, right? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. His ways are just higher than ours. His thoughts above our thoughts. But I promise he has revealed himself. This has not been yet proven to be false. It is true. God is good. And he has a good sovereign plan for us. That's a good place for a hallelujah. But we'll get there. We'll get get there. We'll get there. 
Praise the Lord. He is the source of truth. This was Paul's commitment to the church, to see them edified, to see them growing in their knowledge of that truth. Our goal is not simply to accumulate knowledge in our heads. That's dangerous. That leads to pride. That causes us to be puffed up by how much we know. The purpose of our classes on Sunday evening and MTC, which starts again this evening, is not so we gain a bunch of information so we can win debates. Look, that's fun. It can be fun, but, but that's not the point. It, it, the, the, the joy comes in the illumination of the truth in the minds of those who don't yet know Christ. When they see him for his goodness and his grace and his mercy towards us despicable sinners. Our goal, like Paul, is to seek truth from the spirit of truth, which is the spirit of God who is sanctifying us to make, whole, make us holy like the God of truth is holy. And we have this great reminder again that God will sanctify those he has justified. He has saved and he will make the children that he has saved like himself. Sanctification is the fruit is the fruit where justification is the root of God's saving grace. We can't see justification, right? It is a declaration made in the heavenly places by which God then declares us righteous, being covered by the blood of Christ. Our sins transitioned and accounted to Christ and having been paid for, God the Father now says, you are holy. I only see Christ. You are found in Christ, in and covered by the blood of Christ. That's justification, but sanctification is the process the Holy Spirit is making as he has promised that he will complete what he started in us, Paul writes to the Philippians, in transforming us into the image of the Son who glorifies the Father. Commitment number three, Christians are committed to life-transforming truth, not just the accumulation of the knowledge of truth, as I've said, but of life-transforming truth. A, be a belief that changes our behavior. Convictions that change our character. A gospel truth that produces good works in our lives, of which the world can see and give glory to the Father in heaven in hope of eternal life. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect in their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. In hope of eternal life. Paul was committed to serving Christ in his church, in edifying the church by increasing their knowledge of the truth, by motivation through his hope of eternal life. Is that what motivates you? Is that what gets you up in the morning? That gets you going today? I know I'm still a citizen of heaven. And I'm just a visitor here. I'm just passing through. I'm a sojourner. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger in this world. I'm a citizen of heaven. My identity is in Christ and I'm just passing through. But my Savior is coming. One can only hope in eternal life if we have life in this risen Christ. If we believe indeed the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, came in human flesh, perfectly lived a perfect, obedient life in submission to the will of his Father, yet voluntarily sacrificed himself to be slain to receive the punishment, the consequences of our sin. Right, The wages of sin is death, yet Jesus did not sin. He voluntarily went to the cross to receive the full wrath, appeasing the fury and the wrath of God towards sin on our behalf of those that he will save and he will glorify. This is the gospel. This is where life is found. And hope is not wishful thinking. Hope in Christ is not wishful thinking. We know it. It is certain because it comes from the God of truth. It's a check cashed. 
We know it even now in part as He has given us the Holy Spirit and as He is working out His fruit in us, transforming us. And we will know it fully, our salvation fully attained when Christ returns and we are in those glorified bodies. I don't know if I've been thinking about it this week, obviously, because the text points us there, but imagine that reality. How much time do we think reflecting on this truth that God is going to glorify those He saves, He's going to sanctify and give an eternal inheritance of perfect life forever. Can we even imagine what perfect life is like? Paradise. Can you imagine that? Imagine, is it possible to imagine a perfect heaven and a perfect earth without the corruption or the effect of sin? Imagine just being able to perfectly communicate with each other. I've been thinking about that a lot this week because I'm not a great communicator. But imagine that what I'm thinking in here, that is based on truth because my mind has been illuminated perfectly. No longer do I have sinful thoughts and other things that distract me from being able to attain the truth of the glory of God. And then being able to put those in perfect words. And and not only now you're hearing the words, but you're also interpreting what I mean behind those words perfectly. I I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that let alone being able to walk, fellowship, relate to each other properly, relate to God perfectly. Spend more time thinking about that this week. Thinking about things above. It is a command of Christians. Think about things above, not things below. Reflect on this reality. I promise you, you'll be so less worried and anxious about earthly things when you remember where you're going. Remember who's coming back for you, and you're just here now, just waiting patiently, living faithfully, but the Master is coming back. Lord, come now. Lord, come quickly as Revelation ends. Come quickly, Lord. He's coming. He's never failed on a promise, and He's promised to return. Spend more time there, because God never lies, and He promised it before the ages began. Another aspect of God's divine nature that my life group has looked at as we've discussed the immutability of God or the unchanging nature of God, that, and that includes His words, what He has said. They cannot be altered. They cannot be changed. They will come to pass. It's going to happen. He never lies. He is not man that He is subject to change. As the author of Hebrews reminds us neatly, and I have lots of references, but I'm just going to go to one right now. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, that is his character and his promise, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. What have you anchored your souls in? You're anxious, you're stressed. Hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. And before the ages began, literally before eternal ages in eternity past, as I already said, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world began, he had set all these things in place. The triune God sovereignly ordained every detail of everything in all of the ages for his good pleasure and for his glory. He's going to deliver on his promise. A Christian is committed in hope of eternal life. We are consumed with heavenly things, with the work of our Father in heaven. May we commit ourselves to that work. At the proper time manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. This is, this is so neat in contrast with before the ages began, which has us thinking about eternity past. And now Paul says, and at the proper time or at the due time, he's saying, and right now he's fulfilled his promise. Right now he has manifested his word. That is his declaration, his message. 
the gospel. Namely, through the preaching, the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. The plan is unfolding perfectly, right on time, at the exact time designated as sovereignly ordained from eternity past. Nothing is going out of order. There's no plan B. He's not scrambling because we really messed things up a lot more than he thought. That's not what's going on. It's now. Salvation has come. Sinner, again, if you have not received this grace, if you don't personally know the goodness and the grace and mercy of the Savior, if if you haven't come to terms with the grips that God the Father, Father is the holy and righteous judge and we all have violated His perfect moral law and therefore He as Creator then gets to state what the consequences are and He says the wages of sin is death. But God, rich in mercy, has demonstrated His love towards us by the sending of His Son. I've shared that before, and if you haven't received that, if you're not clinging on to the hope of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, well, it's your only hope. Please receive it now. Again, we don't know when that master returns, and I hope before I'm finished, he's here. Do this now. This is a matter of urgency. Receive this free gift of salvation. Receive it with thanksgiving while He still graciously offers and extends His loving and powerful arms to you. You do not have the power to save yourself. This is it. There is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Me. This is it. Receive it. It's here The work is finished. You can stop struggling to try to clean off the muck and mire and the disgust of your sin because you'll never do it. But Christ, marvel as He he draws you out of your mess of sin, out of the filth. And He breaks the chains of its slavery to you. He washes you clean, spotless, without blemish. By the blood of his perfect, spotless, and righteous lamb, Christ, and he covers you with that blood, that righteousness, that perfection. And Christ prepares you like a trophy of his grace, his prized and cherished possession, to stand you in glory before God the Father, to glorify him for all of eternity. God has given us his word. This is the gospel message that centers around the person and work of Jesus Christ, of which I've been proclaiming. And I hope if you hear nothing else, you're hearing that over and over again. This word is our only source of content for faithful preaching and teaching. Please, if there is ever anything else besides these words being proclaimed over here, get out. Get away. Get far away. Everything we need is right here in the word of truth. His word is sufficient. And Paul said it's been manifested now in this word through the preaching of which I have been entrusted. This is how we share life in Christ. Again, the last part of our mission, have life, do life, and share life. We proclaim it. Paul writes to the the Romans reminding us that it is through the preached word of Christ. Faith comes from the preached word. Word of Christ. This is how salvation comes. It is the proclamation of the gospel which is the power to save all who believe. This is how God has chosen in His infinite wisdom to make righteousness possible for the unrighteous. And then lastly, Paul, by the command of God our Savior. God our Savior. Paul uses the title Savior 12 times in all of his letters. Six of those are found right here in Titus. I hope you get the evangelistic thrust of what Paul is trying to declare and make very clear to the church here. This isn't about gathering together, sitting down, and being entertained and having our ears tickled. This is about living this thing out. Now you know it, now go and show it. Declare it. 
proclaim it. This is the only hope for everyone you ever love. Don't tell me you love your family and your friends and your co-workers if you're not willing to declare to them the only message that ever matters for them. This is our only hope. God the Father is appropriately called God the Savior here and, and in three, three times in Titus because He's the author of salvation. In the very next verse, we're going to look like Jesus is also appropriately called Savior. And He's called Savior three times in the letter to Titus because He accomplished salvation. God the Father authored salvation. Therefore, He is worthy to receive the title God our Savior. And Jesus accomplished salvation for us, so he is worthy of being called Jesus, our Savior. This and so much more, the beautiful redemptive doctrines taught in this letter indicate this major thrust that it is necessary for us to be equipped for effective evangelism. This is part of the mission. We know the Lord handed down to us through the disciples, gave us the mission to make disciples of all nations. That begins with the accurate declaration of what the gospel message is. And we call that evangelism. It's just sharing, bearing a witness to what God has done, what he has accomplished in Christ. May we not forget it. Last commitment is a Christian is committed to the faithful proclamation of the word of God. Read that word as doctrine or teaching or the gospel. Read preaching as just the proclamation or the witness or the testifying. Paul's not talking like this kind of preaching. He just means in the speaking, the sharing of the truth. Let's not forget our mission handed down to us. Make disciples of all nations. Are we committed to this? Are we committed to making disciples which requires us to share the gospel, the good news of the person and work of Jesus Christ? Last verse to Titus. My true child in a common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. My true child. This is a. Titus was a spiritual son, a genuine convert of Paul's, like Timothy, a true believer and gospel partner in Christ, his beloved companion. Yes, it's, it's addressed to Titus up here, but the. The letter also wraps up, and so it is obvious Paul meant for this to be read and shared for the churches as he writes in his last verse, all who are with me send greetings to you, greet those who love us, and grace be with you all. It is to Titus, but it is for now, by the providence and preservation of the word for all of us in the church. Do we share this common faith that Paul shared with Titus, our identity in Christ, our commitment to serve Christ's church, a commitment to truth which accords with godliness, a commitment to the hope of eternal life, and a commitment to sharing a faith which comes by the hearing of the preached word of Christ. If we hold this faith in common, I want to invite you to the table. We're going to receive communion. We're going to remember how life, how we received life, how we found even as Paul summarizes neatly in the salutation, the blessings that come in Christ, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Savior. That is what we do when we come together here and remember and reflect on what God the Father, what Christ Jesus, what the Spirit of God has done to pour out grace and make peace possible for us wicked sinners cleansed by Christ. So we're going to sing a song now. And as we approach and partake of these elements, as we sing this song, I want you to consider first if you haven't accepted and received God's gracious gift of salvation. After our song, I'll come up and give further instructions. Father, thank you for our time thus far, Lord. And as we continue to celebrate and worship you again in song, but then through one of the ordinance of which you put in place that whenever we would gather, whenever we would partake of the bread and of the blood, we would be reminded of your sacrifice, your body sacrificed for us on the cross, your blood shed on our behalf to make grace, to, for us to receive grace and to make peace possible for us. 
May we reflect on these realities now, and if we don't know them to be true of ourselves, if we cannot say our identity is in Christ, Lord, I pray those individuals would speak this morning, would receive the offer you have extended, would come to speak with me or Pastor Luke after this message, or come forward for prayer and to talk and to receive it and to know it. Lord, for there's nothing in this world by which is more important than the truth of your gospel. For it matters for eternity. Receive our worship in this song this morning.